Hey class, I'm Mr Thornton and I'm going to help you get that C in your GCSE. In the first half of this two-part lesson on chromatography, I'm going to cover how chromatography works. This topic was suggested by Ibtissim Adam, Emily Coltman, Arif Arif XIAI7 Islam, Pedgy16, Jack Lan, James Sharp, Max Beasley, Cristiano Jepsen, English Gent, Laura Snape, and the MacBeast TMB. Thanks guys. If you've got a topic which you'd like me to cover, then just leave a comment below. Chromatography is so easy that you first see it normally at key stage three. It's the thing where you put dots of ink on a piece of paper and watch as water spreads up the paper and it separates out the inks. That's all there really is to all of chromatography. It gets a little bit more advanced and a little bit more complex, but that's the basic idea behind all of it. So you have seen this before usually. And it's a pretty cheap and easy way to rapidly identify different substances in a mixture. This can be useful for all sorts of reasons, but particularly when you've got small amounts of a substance in a mixture. For example, if you've got a sample of urine from an athlete and you're trying to identify if there's any drugs in there, or if you've got a sample of food and you're trying to identify if there's any additives in there which shouldn't be in there, or colorings in there which shouldn't be in there, then chromatography is the way to go. And we're going to start out with that type of chromatography which you've already seen, paper chromatography, which, although this may surprise you, is actually a valid industrial chemical technique. It's a little bit more complex than you might have done in your science lessons at Key Stage 3, but it's basically the same idea. Let's imagine that we've got a sample of dye from some food which we want to investigate. And that sample is a mixture. So quite often colours, dark colours like black and brown, do tend to be a mixture of other colours of inks and dyes and pigments. And let's say that we're suspicious that in there, there is an illegal pigment. There's a pigment which shouldn't be in there. But we can't tell just from looking at it because it's a mixture. So let's add three other pigments as well. Let's say that A and B are completely fine, they're totally legal red pigments, but C that is an illegal pigment. It shouldn't be found in any food. It's an illegal additive. So what we need to do is separate out the different dyes and pigments in our sample and see if it matches up with C. If it matches up with A and B, no problem. If it matches C, then we've got a problem in there. Now, what we need to do to separate these out is add a solvent. This is where you dip your piece of filter paper in a piece of water and the water acts as a solvent and the solvent steadily spreads up your piece of filter paper. As it does that, it dissolves the inks, it dissolves the different pigments in there. And those different pigments are carried up the paper along with that solvent, along with the water, which is steadily spreading its way up. Now, different pigments have different solubilities. Some of them dissolve much more easily than others. So the most soluble ones will work all the way to the top very quickly, and the least soluble ones won't get as far up that piece of paper. And so that's what separates them out. It's basically their solubility. And so as it spreads up our piece of paper here, we can see that our uh, sort of dark browny black colored pigment has actually separated out into red, green, and blue pigments. These are the three in the mixture. Notice how far up the piece of paper the red has got. Unfortunately, it doesn't line up with A or B. Those are both red pigments, but they're both the legal ones. They're both fine. They're different red pigments though, and that's the crucial thing, that there's more than one red pigment which you might use. So those two have steadily spread up the paper. They're different pigments and they've got different solubilities. And C is our illegal pigment and it's at a different point on the piece of paper. It's traveled a different distance to the other two because again, it's a different substance and it's got different solubility. Now the red pigment in our original mixture of different pigments over there, that has traveled the same distance up the piece of paper as our illegal red pigment. So we know that the illegal red pigment is the one which has been used in our mixture that we're testing. And we can say that this therefore must be an illegal mixture and whatever that food is, let's say, that can be banned, that can be stopped from using that type of pigment. So this is a simple application for how you might use it, but that is the basic principle. 
that the more soluble things move further up towards the end of uh, our piece of filter paper, the less soluble things don't move as far, and the distance that they move, that is what allows us to tell them apart. It allows us to separate them out. And if we know the distance that standard pigments move, if anything lines up with those standard ones, we know exactly what it is. Those concepts show up on every exam board specifications. There are a few slight differences between the exam boards though. If you're doing OCR 21st century chemistry, for example, then you actually need to know a little bit more. We would talk about the solvent and uh, the pigment which it's carrying as being the mobile phase in our chromatography. And the thing that it's moving along, in this case the filter paper, that would be the stationary phase. So the filter paper doesn't move, it's stationary, and the solvent carrying the pigments with it, that does move, it steadily spreads up our filter paper, and so that's the mobile phase. For OCR 21st century chemistry, you also need to know the difference between paper chromatography and thin layer chromatography. They are almost exactly the same. They work in a very, very, very similar way. The only real difference is that instead of a piece of paper in thin layer chromatography, you've got some sort of substance that's spread in a thin layer on a substance such as glass that isn't going to absorb your solvent. And then your substances spread along that thin layer, whatever it's made of, and it can be things like silica gel, all kinds of things can be used. It's quite often, it gives you a better separation. And so that is why it's used. And it can sometimes be used for a wider variety of things. But again, it's basically the same idea. You've got that uh, mobile phase, the solvent spreading along the solid phase, which is the thin layer of whatever it is you've used. So silica gel or something and you get the different things separating out. It often gives you better separation though. Uh, again though, it's rapid, it's cheap, it's easy to do, and it's used very often in things like food testing. One final thing with this type of chromatogram, if you're studying the Edexcel specification, if you're studying the OCR 21st century specification, or if you're studying the WJEC specification, you need to be able to calculate the RF value of different pigments in a chromatogram like this. And that's really easy, actually. It sounds a little bit intimidating, but it's dead easy. RF is short for retardation factor or retention factor. Both terms can be used. And it's basically a way of expressing how far up the piece of paper the pigment has traveled compared to the solvent. It's pretty much the same as calculating a percentage. Basically, what you do is you take out a ruler and you measure how far up the piece of paper your pigment has traveled and then you divide that by how far up the piece of paper the solvent has traveled. So let's imagine that our red pigment, our suspicious one here, has traveled 7.5 centimeters up our piece of paper. And let's imagine that the solvent has traveled 10 centimeters up the piece of paper. To calculate the RF value, all you, all you do is 7.5 divided by 10. And you get an answer of 0 0.75. And that should be the RF value for this particular pigment. And of course, if we do that for our sample pigment here, uh, letter C, we get exactly the same RF value. So because those two RF values, they both match one another, we know that it's the same compound. It's just a way of putting a number to what we're looking at here, rather than relying on everyone having to use exactly the same size piece of paper. Because of course, when you do this, it doesn't matter what size piece of paper you use, you should still get the same RF value because it's basically a percentage of how far up the piece of paper it's gone. It doesn't make a difference how big the paper is. I hope that video really helped you. To see what else I can help you with, there's lots more videos to check out on my channel. Scroll down the main page there to see I've already sorted them into playlists to help you find the video you need. You can also check out my revision guides, which cover everything you need to know for the exam. They feature links to my videos, revision tips, cover both foundation and higher tier, and unlike a lot of revision guides, they also point out what you don't need to waste time learning. If you want to check your learning, try the Snap Quiz website and app, which allow you to identify which areas you need to spend the most time learning. Remember, this is the only YouTube channel which brings you the teachers, the textbooks, and the tests all on your terms, on mobile phone, tablet, or computer for you to revise when you want and how you want, even immediately before you go into the exam. All of these links and any others for this video will be down in the description. 
Lastly, it really does help my channel if you want to leave your likes, if you subscribe, or if you know someone else who's having trouble, tell them to search for Mr. Thornton. Good luck in your GCSEs everyone, and thanks very much for watching.